Chapter 25, Skeletons in the Forest, Part 2, starting page 173. Eating the bread, we continued across a field, stumbling wearily over fresh plowed earth. Not far from the first farm, we found a barn. No one seemed to be around. We made our way in, then up a ladder, and climbed far back into a cozy loft. Covering ourselves with hay, we fell into a deep sleep. When we awoke, it was to the sound of men's voices below. It was dark. Faint light from a lantern moved along gray wooden walls. Terrified of being discovered, we scarcely breathed, let alone moved. Finally, the men left. When we were sure they were gone, we stole away into the night. This became a pattern for us. We traveled at night, avoiding roads. From fields and gardens, we took onions, strawberries, and potatoes. During the day, we slept in barns, patches of woods, and haystacks, and once in a shed made of woven sunflower stalks. In the shed, we found an old coat hanging from a nail and a heavy work shirt covered with black grease stains. The coat went to Tamara, and I took the shirt. Not only did they provide warmth, but buttoned up tightly, they also concealed our Soviet tunics. From our experience at the first farmhouse, it seemed clear that it was better to look like civilian refugees, which, in reality, we were, rather than in any way connected with the military, either German or Russian. Tamara's cough all, went, all but went away for a time. Then it returned with renewed fury. Her head was hot to the touch, and her face was alternately flushed or ghostly pale. With each passing hour, she grew sicker, weaker. I knew I had to do something, but what? I'm going to find a doctor for you, I told Tamara, this as we hobbled along together, one moonlit night across open ground. I'll be all right, she insisted, her words punctuated with coughs and her voice so faint and raspy I could scarcely hear her. I did not press her on the matter, but my mind was made up. I could not let Tamara die. Despite the risk, we would enter the first village or town we came to and try to get her medical attention. Later that night, we saw a large convoy of military vehicles. Backlit by moonlight were troop carriers, trucks pulling light artillery pieces, and tanks. I guessed that they were Russian, which I would later learn to be wrong. They were German. None of it seemed real. Suddenly, I felt dizzy and unwell and sat down, almost fell down. We crawled into a thicket and watched the convoy. We fell asleep. I do not remember waking up. My next recollection is that it was daytime and we were plodding along a dirt road. Everything seemed very dreamlike. My mind drifted. Space and time became disordered. I remember noticing a huge oak tree, perhaps a hundred meters ahead. Suddenly the tree was not there. Turning around, I saw the tree some thirty meters behind us. I tried to focus myself to concentrate and thought I was succeeding. I wasn't. We kept passing things I had not noticed were ahead. An overturned tractor laying beside the road, a cow drinking from a trough, a girl on crutches. All of these things and more took me by surprise. A very old, bent-over man shuffled by and said good morning in German. I greeted him in kind. A horse-drawn cart with a peasant woman at the reins approached us. Ahead I could see the outskirts of a large town and asked her the name of the place. She seemed frightened of me and, whipping her horse into a trot, hurried off as far as she could go. Something's wrong with my head, I remember telling Tamara. She muttered something, but I didn't understand her, and then she laughed and broke off into a fit of coughing. I was wondering what she was laughing at about when I realized we were on a steep cobblestone roadway. Below was a large town, and nearby, up the road, was a very large, impressive-looking house surrounded by a high stone wall. Tamara and I sat down on a curbing. How long we sat there, I don't know, but I began to feel better and my mind seemed to clear. What do we do now, X? Tamara asked. We'll go into town. I got to my feet. Tamara looked up at me but continued to just sit there. Puttering up the roadway came a strange-looking car. The thing was small, humpbacked in shape, the body domed in corrugated metal. At the wheel was a heavy-set old woman. She brought the odd vehicle to a stop in front of a wrought iron gate in the wall surrounding the house. She glanced my way. 
Could you please open the gate for me? She asked in German, then repeated herself in a language I didn't know. Yes, ma'am, I answered, and then with considerable difficulty managed to open the twin halves of the heavy gate. Tamara got to her feet. She was bone thin, pale and wheezing. You're ill, said the woman in her sort of lilting German. Tamara, not understanding, looked to me. I leaned forward down, down to the open window. Please help us, I said. We are so tired and hungry, and we can't think straight anymore. Who are you? We're from a medical unit, I answered. I don't know where any of the others are. I think most of them are dead. Little blue eyes in a pink, big pink face looked over us over. Gears shifted raggedly. Well, we can't have you dead, too, she said. Come, come, get in the car. We got in. The funny-looking car growled up the steep driveway, navigated a sharp turn, and then pulled to a stop in a pretty courtyard in front of a large, pinkish-looking stuccoed house.